muted. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Welcome, everybody, to the Ted Alexandro Show. I am your host, Ted Alexandro, coming to you live from an undisclosed bunker location. Man, oh, man. The times, they are exciting. What the hell is going on? What is going on? Have you just been refreshing your phone? Isn't that a misleading word? There's nothing refreshing about it. You just check on Nevada, Pennsylvania, Georgia, what are the others? North Carolina, I guess. There's, there's, a, there's several states that are still counting. Man, this election, this year, is, is turning out to be uh, everything we could have hoped. And now uh, I, w- I was told by our producer extraordinaire just prior to coming on that Trump was uh, on the television saying that uh, he's, he's contesting the results. They won. In fact, they won. So, uh, you know, I, I thought, well, you know, this is finally the role that Trump was born to play. He never wanted to actually win. He thrives when he's been wronged in some way. And I think his base as well. They are a people, a tribe that thrives on the system wronging them in some way. So this is really the sweet spot for Trump. This is he he was robbed of this moment the first time around because he defeated Hillary Clinton. So I can only imagine his disappointment at finding out that in fact he won and was the president of the United States. He, he was prepared to talk about the system and they stole it from him and to rile up the base because that is like, that is the script for him, right? That is the world wrestling federation script that works the best and creates the most chaos, the most intrigue sells the most papers, gets the most ratings, the most clicks, whatever you want to call it. Trump loves that kind of thing. So now he's finally got it. He's got it. It looks like Joe Biden, by most counts, is on the precipice. I think he has 264 electoral votes as we we come to you live. I was talking with my wife on election day and she made uh, a a good point. Our executive producer extraordinaire, Madeline Geraldine, uh, she made what I thought was like a very, a very pertinent point about these last two presidential elections. And that is like, (laughs) And it, it, it applies to me as well and to so many uh, people who I know. You don't realize how much you're actually rooting for the Democrat because we don't like them. You know, we didn't like Hillary Clinton as a candidate. Uh, we certainly don't like Joe Biden as a candidate. 
but you don't realize how much you're actually rooting for them until Trump, until election day. And you, it, it really, it re, you realize that Trump is the alternative, you know, it, in a very visceral way, it finally hits you because it's all, the whole election cycle is eternal. So you kind of lose sight of that very basic fact that Trump can win, you know, and he did in 2016. And until Hillary lost, we didn't realize how much we actually wanted her to be president relative to Donald Trump. Let's, let's make that perfectly clear. And it, it, the same with Biden, like, you know, I, I have no love for Joe Biden as a candidate. The guy has lost multiple times for a reason. Uh, but, you know, again, with Donald Trump being the alternative, obviously, <laughs> that's who we're, we're rooting very hard for Joe Biden. That's the only option. And that was, you know, that was my thought throughout this. It's like, you can vote for third party. Go ahead, vote for Kanye West. And I noticed in several uh, states, Kanye got in excess of 10,000 votes. Which is funny because that's, I, I think the best third party performance has been by Joe Jorgensen. I love that name. The Mets had a first baseman named Mike Jorgensen in the early 80s. Came by way of the Montreal Expos, I think. Good glove, no hit. But Joe Jorgensen was the libertarian candidate for president. And uh, I think she uh, got the, the most votes. Uh, the Green Party did not perform well. Howie Hawkins, a stalwart teamster, Green Party candidate. Love the guy, but, you know, the, the Green Party uh, just perennially does not, uh, and I'm sure it's partially their own fault, partially the system's fault. It's, you know, the system does no favors to any third party candidate. And yet look at Kanye. You know, I think he got more votes than Howie Hawkins in, in many states. Uh, and then there were states, I can't remember which one it was. Maybe it was Nevada Maybe it was Vermont. I can't remember, but there were states where no candidate got uh, more votes than some of the third party. Like they just mu people must have left President Blank as a protest of sorts. But that said, my feeling this whole election, and and you know, I've taken criticism from the hardcore lefties, of which I number myself am uh, myself among. Mind you, uh, look, I've I've been in the streets for you know the the better part of the past decade, protesting, uh, really all of the things that Joe Biden uh, represents. You know, I've been in the streets for Black Lives Matter. Joe Biden authored the crime bill, and uh, you know ha has had a hand in creating mass incarceration as we know it. Uh, I was protesting Occupy Wall Street. Obviously, he was in office with Obama for the the bank bailouts and uh, all of the things that followed that that uh, undergirded you know the capitalist system sailing along unchanged, uh, if, if not further uh, empowered. And of course, uh, I marched against the Iraq war and, and Biden voted for that. So, so this guy, like pretty much up and down, uh, does not represent my politics in any way against the Green New Deal. But I've never rooted harder for a presidential candidate, because again, as, as my wife pointed out, like you don't realize how much you really just hate Trump and all that he embodies, all he represents, all he puts out in the world uh, until it's election day and you're seeing the numbers come in. And um, 
I like the word malignant, the malignant presence that is Trump. Um, I just feel that, you know, as, as um, lacking as, as Biden is and, and as, uh, you know, really as uh, establishment as he is, he is not vile uh, in his public persona in, in the face that we put out to the world as a country, you know, and that's a very, very low and uh, embarrassing bar that we are uh, setting for ourselves. But, you know, we're picking a CEO, you know, a face of this company called uh, America, the face of global capitalism, And I was looking through an old notebook and and I thought to myself, like, what other company can change upper management every four years? Change in quotes, right? And and not and not skip a beat. You know, how do you go from from Bush to Obama to uh, to Trump? And now. It seems to Biden unless the count, you know, uh, takes the next four years. <laughs> um, like, how do you, how does that, how does that flow continue? And, and you change, presumably change the face of the, uh, the upper management and there is a, uh, a barely perceptible change when you zoom out in the constant war, an economy that serves the wealthiest, healthcare that's out of reach for most people, you know, and the ripple effects of that in people's lives, mental health, physical health people avoiding going to the doctor at all. And if something should befall them uh, with it comes financial ruin. And again, Biden has said he's, he's not for uh, Medicare for all. He's not for a green new deal. So make no mistake. These are not the things that people are in any way excited about Joe Biden for. I mean, I'm talking about progressives here, you know, And you can't help but think back to Bernie Sanders' campaign and the things that that embodied and uh, all of the things that that engendered in terms of policy. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's maddening the ways in which you're, you're kind of made to feel like it's sour grapes or uh, that it's childish or unrealistic. Um, and maybe that's true. You know, maybe that is true uh, because obviously politics is corrupt. The democratic uh, party is corrupt and uh and colluded to uh, to really shun not only Bernie Sanders because again I've said this before I, Bernie Sanders I love him God bless I'm glad you know he really uh, became the focal point of this movement gave people a, a person around whom to coalesce uh, somebody who has integrity uh, to the extent that he's been about these things for decades. So he, he has been a very important figure in that almost, again, allowing us to say like, oh, wow, I'm not crazy. <laughs> I'm not crazy. It is possible for a candidate to talk about Medicare for all, a Green New Deal, free college education, debt forgiveness. I'm not crazy after all. You know, socialism as a concept, attacking capitalism as the problem but you're made to feel insane for even entertaining that. So, 
you know, every time these elections come up and, and it's a squeaker between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, uh, be, uh, granted because of the Electoral College, it looks like Biden, uh, like Hillary, will win the popular vote. But when you're not giving people things to get excited about the way Bernie was, the way he, you know, he was uh, centering all of these things. I can't help but think without a doubt. And as many people have come out to vote in this election, I have to think that as many or more would have come out to vote for Bernie Sanders. I think he would have roundly defeated Donald Trump. But why talk about that now, right? So Biden is uh, is on the brink, 264 on the road to 270. Trump has said he won. He's declared victory. I mean, he could have declared victory. I don't know why he waited till today. He could have declared victory for 2020 as he was being sworn in in 2016. Why not just say, well, while we're here, you know, with his hand on on the Bible, the thing should burst into flames. Um, while we're here, I uh, let's just swear me in for, for the next the next election as well. So yes, I'm, I'm, I'm pulling for Biden and I know that's almost verboten for, uh, for, for progressives to say, how dare you? How dare you? Look, this isn't the fight. Okay. The election is not the fight. The fight is ongoing every day. You know, I don't know what to tell you. I don't know what to tell you. I mean, and people have, can people can have this hard line stance about voting? And look, I've been there. I voted for Jill Stein twice. Um, you know, I mean, look, the, the, the thing that I, that I can say is do what your conscience conscience tells you and you have to keep it fluid i voted for obama enthusiastically in 08 i did not vote for him in in 2012 i voted for jill stein because i i felt as though uh he betrayed all of the things that he campaigned on and obviously with uh the financial crash and the bailing out of of the banks and, uh, you know, just the propping up of, of Wall Street, uh, i.e. I. capitalism, and leaving people in the lurch repeatedly, uh, you know, to say nothing of all the, you know, all the other things that we've seen over these years, Flint, Michigan, uh, not having clean drinking water, I, still today, you know, uh, so the ways in which both Democrats and Republicans alike have failed wholly, roundly, and absolutely failed the populace are staggering. So uh, I am not looking to either of these men to change those things. You know, they, they will be the CEO. They will be brought in. They will do what presidents do. Very likely, uh, wars will continue and, and perhaps escalate. And, you know, y- you would think and you would hope that against the backdrop of a pandemic that has hit people very hard financially, uh, has hit people very hard physically with, with uh, the health things that people are dealing with, if not uh, outright dying 235,000, I think Uh, we're still in the midst of the second wave and who knows how long this goes on, you know, who knows how long the effects of the pandemic continue the, the myriad effects uh, in the ways that it affects the economy. And when we talk about the effects on the economy, let's face it, we're talking about the effects on working people because 
the wealthy have done marvelously throughout. You know, the, the wealthiest, the billionaires have, have uh, exponentially increased their wealth during the pandemic. So when they talk about the economy, they're not talking about one economy. You know, the, the, the absurdity of talking about, even when Trump would talk about how the economy was rolling along before the pandemic, he was talking about his economy, you know, the wealthy economy, the oligarch economy. That's different than people who are trying to, you know, live paycheck to paycheck. So, look, I'm sorry if, if, if I'm not giving enough excitement to, because uh, I am excited about Joe Biden potentially defeating Donald Trump, all right? Uh, for all of the things that Biden represents, uh, again, also was, uh, had credible sexual assault allegations against him by Tara Reid. If you haven't seen her story, uh, I would advise you to look that up because I'm, look, I'm not one, if you know my comedy, if you know my life, I'm not one to put aside what is true, you know, like the things that are real. I don't have to wave a, a flag and a pom-pom for, uh, for Joe Biden. I hope he wins. Someone had uh, like a, a campaign button or sticker that said, uh, Joe Biden sucks, vote Biden, <laughs> you know? And that's kind of how I felt about it. Um, so that's where we are now, because obviously Trump is, is vile and, and uh, malignant and needs to be removed. Uh, the third party votes are, are kind of... Um, wishful thinking and, and strategic. Um, and, you know, I suppose necessary in some sense, as I said, I voted green the past two elections. Uh, but I almost feel as though in some way that's more, it's almost like more for yourself than, than anything else, you know, like what, Vote your conscience, that thing. If it helps your conscience, by all means. It's like having a, a, a go vegan bumper sticker on your car. You know, it, maybe it makes you feel good. But it's not going to make anybody else go vegan. And that's coming from someone who pretends to be vegan. So friends, this is the crazy uh, situation that we find ourselves in. And uh, look, you know, uh, I don't have any answers. I, I, do, I do hope with all my heart that those final six votes trickle in. I know that, uh, you know, th this is like the idea. Isn't this ideal? This is ideal for, uh, for all of the networks, for media, for them to have this horse race, this circus, right? That votes are being counted. Votes were mailed in months before early voting. Count them all. Uh, you know, everything's in play. We're going we're gonna to count every vote. Nevada, Pennsylvania, Georgia, um, and, the, and, and the gap's closing, right? Be because as the mail-in votes come in, those votes apparently are like 75% plus Democratic. It seems as though Democrats uh, take care of business as voters or, or maybe want to live and didn't want to risk going out in a pandemic. And Republicans were like, fuck it, uh, I'm going voting live uh, and then going to Fuddruckers. Look, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm stereotyping Republicans. I think what it comes down to, honestly, I really wonder what percentage of people always vote red, always vote blue, 
and for some people, you know, when you have those single issue voters too, you know, like tax breaks, there's some people that they don't care if it's Trump or Bush, it could be Kasich, it could be whoever, it could be Jeb Bush, Marco Rubio, Trump, whoever is red, it, that's who they're going for because they will likely put money in their pocket. That's how they vote. When they look at the voting and they look at the, the they might as well say, keep more of my money or pay into being part of a society. And they're going to click keep more of my money every time. And same for abortion and same for some of these like social issues. Some people are never going to, you know, they're never going to change who they vote for. And then you have the, the added stew of, of, of uh, overt racism, fascism from, tr- from Trump, you know, that like these, uh, these insane kind of yahoos, people that like want to keep America however they think it should be. And let's not uh, give short shrift to the role that racism and white supremacy has played in, in, in Trump's campaign and in his base because they do everything to vilify a movement of people pleading for their lives. They do everything to paint that as some sort of rogue Antifa un-American people pleading for their lives peacefully, overwhelmingly peacefully, whatever violence has come up has been minimal and oftentimes was instigated by agent provocateurs. But Trump's base is so inundated and so brainwashed with that white supremacist cop culture bullshit that they see a movement of people peacefully pleading for their lives because of you know, just historical from our inception, historical murder and desecration of black lives without consequence. Without consequence. And again, talk about continuity, right? Black Lives Matter started with a black president in office. So these things continue unabated, Democrat, Republican, Democrat, Republican, maybe Kanye someday. But the insanity and and the white supremacy that is baked into Trump's, you know, they wrap it up in the flag, they wrap it up in a lot of that, make America great, but it's white supremacy, keep America white. You know, this fantasy of a white country that works for a lot of people. Now that's not to say that, you know, I mean, obviously a lot of Latino people uh, have, have voted for Trump for whatever reasons, a lot of, you know, people of, of all ilks. Uh, So, you know, I'm not painting it as all one thing. I'm not saying Trump's all white yahoos. Uh, I'm saying it, People have a lot of different reasons for voting the way they do. But that said, Biden needs six more. I think Nevada delivers those six, hopefully in the next, uh, you know, before midnight. But Trump, as, as only he can do, is declaring victory, saying it's stolen. I'm sure he's going to file lawsuits. That's his other move. He's going to sue everyone, sue every state, sue every, uh, every governor, every secretary of state of, of, uh, of all the various states. So we likely won't have, unless like, you know, Supreme Court steps in, which with it being as uh, stacked Republican as it is, you, you wouldn't think that they're going to like declare anything against Trump too uh too quickly so we'll see folks 
We shall see. I, for one, am hoping to see Trump vanquished. Vanquish the orange malignancy. And yes, that means bring in President Joe Biden. All right, folks, you can text me at 909-575-0737. That's 909-575-0737. Please, if you have not, hit the notification bell, subscribe to the channel. And uh, if you wish to support the show, as so many have, and we thank you, please go to patreon.com slash Ted Alexandro. Your donations, your contributions sustain us, sustain the show, and we do appreciate each and every one. Give you a little bit more on that later. Uh, today, we have a very special guest, someone I've been wanting to have on from the beginning. And uh, I actually thought to myself, you know, it, it's probably best to have, have this gentleman come on around election time. He is the world champ. He's one of my favorite comedians. He's one of my favorite people, a good friend for many, many years. Please welcome to the show, the world champion, Judah Friedlander. Judah. What's up, Ted? There he is. The champ. What's up, man? How are you, buddy? Incredible. Judah, yes, you're sir. Really, you're really the only guy equipped, in my opinion, to make sense of the mayhem that we are currently uh, trying to make sense of. What uh, the background that I see behind you is is probably uh, in some way reflects the a little bit of the the, the mayhem, the chaos. Uh, is that is that a stretch or would you say that's this is a map this is the real map of america that's the electoral okay. map. <laughs> yeah. this is what happens when we get the corporations out of america this is what it looks like <laughs> i'm all for back it. to the basics we're getting it working right i'm all for it i'm all for it so yep. uh, what what do you think uh where do we stand now obviously biden is at uh i believe still at 264 do you think uh, Biden wins? Do you think Trump ever concedes? Like, what the hell is going on? I think we should preference, preference first to everybody that this conversation we're having was recorded uh, three days ago on November 1st. Right? That's right. That's right. Okay, cool. <laughs> but yeah, so um, we'll put that on the scroll. Okay, cool. No, I uh, wasn't going to say. So, yeah, I, I don't know. Before the election, I said... You know, I think this was even, you know, a couple months before the election. I was saying, oh, you know, 70 percent chance uh, Trump gets reelected, whether it's, uh, you know, through legal cheating as well as illegal cheating that would be made legal, <laughs> you know, because the right. country has a lot of legal cheating that should be cheating and that should be treason as well. And um, that's accepted. You know, that's a great point. Yeah. And uh, hold on. That's the authorities coming for me. Hold on. Um, OK, they I'm must gonna have you. They have you on speed. Dial. I'm, I'm going to let that go. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, so, you know, there's so much corruption in the country. And obviously, you know, we're in a we're in a position now where there's where there's more corruption, you know, and when the Voting Rights Act got uh, weakened uh, not that long ago, it, it got even worse. So it's been getting worse and worse. So. You know, for for anyone to defeat the the current regime, they, they have to do it by um, a lot. You know, so yeah, yeah, and it's looking like that. Well, not not, not a lot, but it looks like uh, obviously Biden will win the popular vote as Clinton did, right. and flip enough states potentially. You know, obviously this is all going to be contested, and there'll be recounts and all that kind of yeah. stuff, but. Uh, it looks like the winds are blowing in, in Biden's direction. Now, you and I have, have marched side by side uh, for, for many causes over the years. So I know that your mm -hmm. politics uh, are, are left, uh, even of the Democratic Party. So wait, did you say you said left even of the Democratic Party? Yeah. 
the the way you worded that was implying that they're a left party that they're left well that is um, the presumption of uh, you right. know what i mean you know what i mean yeah i mean they're to the left of the republicans but right that doesn't right. mean they're a left party in, in no. the way i see it yeah. obviously yeah yeah i mean yeah. I would say even the mainstream is to the left of the Democratic Party, but they've done such a masterful job of painting yeah. it that, you know, the left is somehow fringe or or um, radical. Right. Yeah. So. So, well, you know, that brings up a good point, because, you know, America, America has always had minority rule. America has always had minority rule. You know, uh, I mean, when when you look at the, the, the Constitution, you know, and the, the, the founding fathers, notice there's never any founding mothers, first of all, uh, never any founding daughters or sons. Um, and then you also notice some striking similarities between the founding fathers, you know, uh, rich, land-owning, slave-owning, white men. So it's, yeah. I, I wonder who the laws have been written for, you know. So, yeah. And also so we've like, always had minority role, you know, always. right. Right. And it, it occurs to me, too, with even that terminology that we're indoctrinated with founding fathers, like, yeah. you know, Native Americans obviously would not consider them founding and black people and many uh, of the population would not consider them fathers. You yeah. know what I mean? So so yeah. this even the term, the words are so curious. Words have a lot of meanings. Yeah. I, I just tweeted yesterday. I just thought of this new joke. I'm still working on it. But, um, you know, maybe teaching children to play follow the leader was not a good idea. <laughs> you know, you want, I, yeah. I think I think most people don't want a democracy. I think most people, they want, you know, they want someone who's just going to do it. You know, they want to go on with their with their consumerism and superficiality that they're used to. And uh, they don't want they don't most people don't. There's a lot of people who think democracy is voting once every four years, smiling, uh, wearing a sticker that says you voted and, and then uh, sharing it with your friends. Um, yeah. So it's, you know, d democracy is not the default. If you look at humans on this planet and you look at the amount of, you know, tyrants and and peons and uh it's th there's not a lot of democracy throughout throughout civilization pre-civilization the existence of humanity so it's something yeah. that always has to be fought for the default is oppression is basically is what i think yeah yeah and and i think we have been kind of lulled into this passive way of thinking that voting and posting things on social media uh are are replacing real participation mm -hmm. in advocating for, for mm -hmm. change, which has to be sustained as we've seen with any movement yeah. over, over the years. So yeah. how do you, how do you, uh, how do you, you know, kind of make peace with the fact that voting is, is so um first of all ted let's not use the p word peace i mean that's not uh <laughs> that's true that's I not what this country's about let's let's not be so controversial <laughs> right. sorry go ahead what was the question how do you make peace with the fact that that voting is so limited in its impact and that i'm assuming your politics are, are not represented in, in most presidential elections and, and platforms uh, that, that's a good question you know and you know it's you know, I'm not someone who expects fairness. I'm not someone who expects compassion, who ex who expects equality. There are things I always fight for, um, and there's certainly things in general I think are not given, but there are things you have to fight for. You know, it's um, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. And you know, it's funny because when you look at all of the people that make up uh, movements and stuff. I wonder, like, you know, what what is the makeup of each of these people, you know, uh, because you're saying and, and I kind of voice that as well. I, I often say when you join a movement, you're joining the losing team. Yes, that, that's what you're joining. That's what you're signing up for, you know. So but I wonder what percentage of people, uh, you know, have like a real optimism at their core about whether it's I mean, they're very different things, but voting yeah. or um, protest. Or do you just do it, you know, as they say, you don't fight fascists because you're going to win. You fight because they're they're fascists. Right. 
Well, you know, back to the protest thing, you know, until like protesting got mainstreamed, I think uh, about, you know, three and a quarter years ago when the, the current president took office with the women's march. That's when that's the first right. time I ever saw the media, for the most part, be like, hey, this is a great thing, you know, because people always, t- you know, there's the myth out there that there's this left wing and right wing mainstream media. And then there isn't, you know, it, it all leans right to one degree or, or another, you know, yeah. uh, I mean, obviously some are a lot more far right than others, but, but in general, the, they're, they're always, you know, the, the protests on TV news that you see in general um, are either ignored or I remember a couple years ago, I went to a, a protest for, you know, an anti-nuclear uh, arms protest regarding uh you know uh u.s uh north korea relations Mm -hmm. i think there were 20 people there you know this is this is in new york city a city of eight million it's like (laughs) why are 20 people protesting uh the proliferation of nuclear weapons you know (laughs) yeah Uh, 20 20 out of eight million you know yeah Uh, so anyways um, so, so the news, their, their first default is to never show protests. Don't show it. Their second default is, uh, ooh, if there's some really uh, good violence in there that'll get a lot of views, let's show it. And, and let's always either both sides it or show it that, um, you know, the, uh, the people who are being oppressed and protesting are the ones who are the real troublemakers, you know, um, uh, but then, you know, when the current president got, uh, you know, came into office, there was the Women's March, which is a great thing, the Women's March. But it was the first time I saw the media sort of embrace protesting as something that's good. You know, in, in, in sure. general, I, I, it's always looked at as something that, that's bad by the media. And then I've yeah. also seen the right wing uh, or people who are right wing, but they won't refer to themselves as right wing. They'll shit on the protesters, you know, like like Occupy Wall Street, you know, they'd be like, well, well, who's the leader? What do they even want? You know, they would say stuff like that. And then they'd make fun of the way people look, et cetera, et cetera. So it's like, and a lot of these are people, you know, on the right who would claim to be, hey, we're all about free speech. You know, we're not into the PC and we're about free speech. Well, if you're such a First Amendment person, why are you shitting on people who are protesting? That's the First Amendment also, you know. So, yeah, so, they, yeah. so they get the protesters I've seen, would always get attacked from 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 both sides of the mainstream political spectrum in New York, you know, in, in the yeah. U.S. Yeah, and, and and in a certain sense, I feel like protester is such a lazy catchphrase. It's 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 like such a blanket thing for, like you said, people that are exercising free First Amendment rights, free speech, things that are ad, people that are advocating for change that that would really better represent uh the citizenry and and you know to, just to call it like protest like you know it, it's such a simplify a simplification of just like you know we're we're mad about this or whatever when in some cases uh it's obviously talking about people that are being murdered systematically yeah. Yeah. or in the case of nuclear arms like the potential for mass uh yeah. extinction you know so yeah protest you know to me is like it's a little bit limp and a little bit weak for really it's it's to me it's participation in democracy yeah i mean it's fighting for human rights is, is you know it's and and planetary rights you know for the health of the planet you know um, well let's get let's get to that as world yeah. champ too because like yeah. you, i think you do even though you know obviously you you play this uh character to an extent in your comedy but I see you as like a you're a very worldly guy, very knowledgeable yeah. guy. Uh, well, as the world champion, you know, champ world champion. So I'm a person who is a champion of the world of the, and, and the stick up for the rights and all the inhabitants of the world. Right. So some people make the mistake of thinking that that is just uh, relating to your maybe martial arts prowess or other physical right. things. Right. But it, well, you know, years ago. In my act, um, you know, the, the uh, you know, thematically, I in, in my act, I was, you know, when I would talk about all these 
incredibly ridiculous athletic achievements, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And let me just interject that Judah Freelander is a, a, a fine athlete. I've seen yeah, that's true. That's true. Playing that's true. ping pong and, and right, right. True. soccer. Yeah. I mean, this true. is this is this is a uh, a world class athlete. Yeah, all true, all true. But you know, what, when we talk about the stand up act, you know, um, w- with the act thematically, it's satirizing narcissism. You know, this is going back twenty more years. Narcissism on, on an individual level. Yeah. And on and, and it was also on an American level, too. And then over the past, you know, you know, 10, 15 years or so, it's it's been, uh, you know, you know, the act has taken it to, uh, you know, narcissism uh, on a national level that I'm satirizing, uh, you know, America's narcissism as well as humanity's narcissism. You know, not not so. So that's th- those are the general themes, you know, basically, I mean, you know, the um, the the stand up performance film uh, that I put out a few years ago that that is um, tell people the title, please. Oh, yeah, that's America is the greatest country in the United States. One of my favorite specials of the last decade. So that is basically, um, you know, it's a, it's a satire on the dangers of the propaganda of the myth of American exceptionalism, you know, that, that we're the greatest, you know, cause that's something that, that, you know, I've always seen that's, it's not a left or right issue. It's not a Democrat or Republican issue. It's something I've seen in the media. I've seen it in the schools. I've seen it in whether it's a Democrat or Republican president. I'm always saying that America is the greatest country uh, in the world and in the history of the world. And that when you vote for president, you're electing the leader of the free world. And I always wondered, well, how come we're the only country who gets to vote for the leader of the free world? <laughs> and I realized it, doesn't it must sound be free. because we're number one. You know, those other countries just aren't good enough to deserve to earn the right to vote for the leader <laughs> of the free world. And I also wondered why the leader of the free world um, never mentioned helping the people and liberating the people of the unfree world, you know. Uh, yeah, you would think freedom would matter to the leader of of the, of free, the free world, world right? Yeah. So yeah. So that, so that's so so when you're taught that, you know, America is the best, then if things aren't going well for you, you're going to start looking to other things. You're like, hey, I should be doing great right now. America should be doing great, and we're struggling. So hmm. Maybe it's the Democrats or, oh, maybe they're the ones who are messing it up. Or, 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 wait a second, maybe it's that family who just crossed the border 20 minutes ago. Maybe they, who just arrived here with no money 20 minutes ago, are somehow destroying the country more than the most powerful people in the country. Because that's what we know, right? It's always the people with the least economic power who are destroying the country. It's never the people with all the uh, political and economic power doing it. So no, they always have the best interests of the country yeah. at heart. That's one of the lies that, you know, that that you see and you always are like, how do people fall for that one? You know, that would be like the owner. Let's say the New York Yankees baseball team lost a game and the owner of the New York Yankees baseball team would blame their loss on the hot dog guy selling hot dogs in the bleachers. <laughs> You know, it's like, no, that's not how power works. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Although some of those guys could stand to step it up a bit, just to be fair. Uh, right. Now, I do want to say that your your uh, character predated a Trump presidency. So it, to me, it was fascinating that you were playing this narcissistic uh, charlatan kind of Trumpian character that um, probably... I would say brought together elements of uh, world wrestling type of things and uh, this culture of the guru and the self-help, you know, the, the leaders who have all the answers. Uh, But to me, it was fascinating that you were ahead of the curve with, uh, with the Trump presidency and did in fact, did that enable you to foresee that it's very likely this guy could win? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, because there was, I mean, I was doing, you know, bits about my presidential platform and how I'm going right. to be the next president back in 
I don't know, 2010 and pro- pro- probably earlier. You know? Right, and you um, would take you would take you know, questions. I'm, I'm from also the not crowd. the first comic to be, you know, talk doing bits about running for president. You know, I mean that goes. Dick Gregory actually did run for president. Uh, Pat sure. Paulson uh, did bits on that. I mean, mine's done in different ways, but but you know, it's there, there's and there's other comics too. So, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, but um, yeah, so no, I I you know when you know the, the when the current president ran of, of you know I don't know what was it five years ago or something I I always thought he had a good chance you know and. And the media proved, you know, how out of touch they are when they thought he had no chance. And you know what's interesting? Uh, I think it was a couple years ago, MSNBC did a special. uh, Or maybe this was shortly after Trump got elected or something. They did a special, and it was called 25 Years of Trump. And they showed – it was either 20 years or 25 years. Yeah, I think I saw that. uh, being interviewed by NBC news people about what how he thinks the president's doing, what his thoughts are on it, and would he run? This right? is twenty five years ago, and yeah. would he consider running? Right. So, so they did this to show you know how Trump's changed over the years and different lies and stuff like that. But what they didn't realize they were doing is they were admitting that they've been propping this guy up for twenty five years. So it's like. So, you know, here's a guy who never held office, you know, a a, a playboy, uh, rich uh, narcissist, fake, fake millionaire, in, fake in, millionaire. In, in, in the city. And uh, and he's getting serious news time on on serious news channels on a major network about his. Th- I mean, I mean, you talk about money out of politics or whatever. I, I mean, and you talk about serious journalism. What the hell? He was he wasn't a candidate. You know, why were they even interviewing him? You know, right. so, so that right. shows you that they've been propping this guy up uh, and giving him free publicity for decades. It's true. Folks, if you want to text Judah and I, if you have a uh-huh. question, a comment, you can text us at 909 575 0737. Yeah, you know, uh, it is fascinating how he has been on the media landscape, for, you know, for a really my entire adult life uh everything from you know i think anytime letterman had a cancellation they would bring him in last minute and and you know kind of make him into a uh, a cuddly kind of fun figure so uh yeah the 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 lines really blurred and as les moonves famously said yeah trump is bad for america but great for cbs and i and i think that that is really the phenomenon that is ongoing because he is yeah. great. He's great even today, as he's saying, "I'm not. I we won. They're sto- they stole it from that. All of that is great for CNN, and he gives miles and miles of content. To There's everybody. a lot of people making money off of him. A lot of corporations making money off him. Well, you know that's why you know in in, in my act, I I don't or rarely mention him, and um, yeah. You know, I don't want to partake in the whole, you know, feeding his narcissism. And I also don't want to. I mean, I think he is a is, a, you know, is it's very dangerous, the, the person, obviously. And, and in the presidency, it's, it's a very dangerous situation for, for the country and the world. It is. But, you know, I don't spend the bulk of my time. Uh, and if I do stuff that criticizes or satirize him, it's. You know, it's on policy and intent. It's not on superficial reasons. The circus. And so yeah. much of the of the, the ripping is is, you know, like like personal attacks, but not uh which is not really important content wise and yeah. policy wise. No, I think that's that's wise and uh you know it, it, that's probably more people should probably take that approach yeah. of, of not uh, kind of engaging with so much of the buffoonery. Uh, how do you assess uh, a looming Biden presidency? And, and, you know, what, what does that represent to you? And what does that change for you? Like what, what's your assessment of a Biden Harris um, office? 
Well, you know, I don't know. And I still don't know who's going to get, you know, elected. So yeah. I, I, I think you have to, I mean, it's, there's just tons and tons of fighting and work that needs to be done regardless of who wins. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, I think obviously a, a Biden Harris presidency is a, is a much less dangerous presidency. You know, it's much less volatile, you know, as bad as, you know, a, a Biden Harris administration could be on, on so many issues you know, you got to think at least in terms of the pandemic, they're they're going to do a better job. You know, I mean, I, I mean, that seems pretty obvious, you, you know. Um, sure. So, sure. you know, so there are some things where it'll it'll definitely be better. But but again, you know, things are things have to be fought for, you know, and. Um, again, you know, you have a country where even you know, a lot of the votes I would guess that they're getting are coming from people who are not necessarily big fans of them, but they're voting more against the other person, you know? That's right. No, you, and so, that's, a, so, that's an important uh, message yeah. that you've made a, a, a point yeah. that you've made a couple of times now yeah. that the fighting that we do, the participation in democracy has to be ongoing. Yeah. We have a question for you, Judah. Yeah. My Morse code is rusty. What does your hat say? It says next question. <laughs> Good I mean, question. Whoever sent that in. Good question. There's only one thing that that could say. I mean, are you still you're still billing yourself as the champ, the world champion? Well, so if you're still the world champion, then you're still the world champion. There's no need. So. That's no. Obviously. It's in Morse code. It says world champion. <laughs> Ted Judah, in the event that somehow Trump comes out on top and is in office for the next four years. What's going to be different from his first term? Um, I think things, as bad as you think things have been the past four years, and they've been terrifyingly bad, it, things would get a lot worse. Yeah. Yeah. No, I would. And I, I would agree. Very dangerous. It's a very dangerous, and it's not just him. It's the whole, you know, the whole, the whole party is is much different than it was. 30 years ago, you, you know, the, 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 the Democrat party, a Democrat like Biden probably has more in common with a 1950s Republican like Eisenhower than he does uh, present day Republicans. That's why they had a parade of Republicans at the Democratic convention. Right. Right. I mean, whether it's, you know, I mean, it was definitely their strategy to lean right instead of leaning left. Um, whether that's really their ideology or not, uh, it might be a little more nuanced than that. I, I don't know. You know, it fascinates me how the Republicans, uh, either just by dumb luck or or by design, have realized uh, making a coalition of the types of Republicans that you're talking about uh, with this Trump phenomenon, QAnon, white supremacy, uh, fascist, authoritarian tendencies, uh, like they don't mind going right or going fringe to uh, extend their base. And the the Democrats would do anything rather than go a little bit left to extend theirs. It's it's a fascinating yeah. thing. Well, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I, you know, I'm someone who, you know, I do comedy and, you know, I, I fight for human rights. I, I don't know political strategy that well. You know, I mean, I, I look at it some and I, I can only speak so much on that. But, you know, I, I would guess that, you know, the the current people, you know, running the Republican Party are, are all about, you know, total power. And um, if they find that someone else is using different tools – uh, to rope people in and misguide people and mislead people so that they can still get what they want. They'll, they'll use that technique. You know, it's yeah. Yeah. And if Trump gives them uh, a direct line to voters that were maybe otherwise not engaged, if, you know, like the country club set of Republicans aren't speaking to the people that Trump is, 
they don't they don't care. They're like, yeah, of course, if Trump is speaking to more voters, that's that's gold for them. Yeah. I mean, they're about total power. Do you think Bernie would have done better against Trump? And what do you think happens in 2024 for the progressive movement? Two questions. Yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> That's a great question. And, you know, I can give you two answers and I have no idea which one's right. You can say, <laughs> yes, um, Bernie's a guy who, you know, I think was is popular and was popular for two reasons. One, his policies and uh, two uh he he does have a personality that not everyone but a lot of people like you know um so but it, it's the policies is is what made him popular i think and i think there are policies that go across the the two mainstream people who vote either republican or democrat it it, it reaches both those groups um and he you know he articulates it well you know he's actually speaking to people for people unlike what the current most mainstream democrats do so um now the next but then i can also see you know the republican you know smear tactics uh which they're very good at you know of and you know they just play the you know calling him the evil socialist and i can see them beating him in a landslide you know so i i don't know you know so it's really, I you know, I think things are hard to predict with that stuff. I mean, I mean, with Biden, they, I, I think they've been pretty successful with, uh, you know, they, they're saying Biden's going to be, you know, if he gets to be president, all the strings will be pulled by AOC and Bernie, which is, I don't think is going to be the case because they, yeah. Bernie and AOC, uh, and I like their policies a lot, they have hardly any power in the party currently and that's right. because the people who are do have the power in the party aren't letting them have any power well so, obama who who was uh, president obviously with B- biden as his vice president really uh is kind of considered the one who orchestrated the yes. kind of coalescing of of freezing out bernie and orchestrating yes. who's going to drop yes. out when and strategizing uh yeah. marginalizing yeah. Yeah. bernie so you would yeah. think biden is of of that ilk he's not going right. to but I, I, I but I think their smears uh, worked on a lot of people who vote Republican of, of, of labeling Biden as this guy who's going to turn socialist. You know, I think oh, uh, yes, for, some, yes. for some people, I, I think that smear did work. So uh, it would probably work even better on someone who does want social democracy. So so I so yes. I don't know. You know, well, the, the thing that I find fascinating about the potential of, of Bernie in a general election is the number of voters that he brings out because the primary you know it almost handicaps like a whole portion of the electorate that i think would come out for uh, the general election yeah i think half the country is not in a party you know so yeah 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 no so so like i said i can i can see i can see it being real close like it is now i can see bernie winning pretty big i can see him losing huge i i don't know you know. Second half of that, what do you think happens in 2024 for the progressive movement? I, I have no idea. I think it's very likely you're going to see a progressive or left-wing third party maybe actually gain some political power. I, I think it might actually happen. Um, and it also depends you know, on a lot. It depends if Biden, if Biden does get in, will the new... Uh, and the members who have been progressive for a while, the few that there are, will they will they actually gain more power? I I, I don't know. You know, I mean, it's I, I'm not a predictor of things. I mean, it, it can it can go different ways, but I, I think there's there would be a big movement to to build a uh, you know a, le- a diverse and left wing party. I mean, I think we should have that. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. I mean, AOC said it herself, you know, if she was in another country, uh, in many other countries, she and Biden would not be in the same party. You know, they, they yeah. might form a coalition government, you know, but they wouldn't uh, be in the same party. Yeah, yeah. I, I would agree that uh, I think after the past two presidential cycles of 2016, what happened to Bernie and I don't like to just focus on Bernie. I'm talking about the progressive movement, how that was snuffed out 
uh, very strategically, both in 2016 and 2020, I think you're right. I think there will be, and, and it's going to take exactly what you've been alluding to. It's going to take sustained work for the next four years yeah. or we can expect the same thing to happen yeah. again. So I'm yeah. hoping uh, that that's what happens. Yeah, and, I, and I'm hoping our, it's our also, pits. I'm hoping it's also more and more diverse when it comes to race, gender, and class. You know, I, I think you have to have, you have to have all that, you know, yeah, um, yeah, I agree. For it to now, have power and for it to be better. You know, it's it's also just better. You know, right, right. Yeah, hopefully, you know, I mean, ranked choice voting and all these things would would be a step in the right direction. Uh, so hopefully, you know, all of these things. But, but yeah, but as far as predicting those things, that's uh, the, they're things to fight for. I, I I can't give you predictions on that. I I don't know. You know. Yeah. No. All I know is that people will continue to be in the streets uh because yeah. there will be ample reasons and some that we can't even predict yet there will yeah. be ample reasons yeah. to be in the streets and but it, you know it's it's also possible you know so many people can become i'm not talking about people who are you know very you know very active politically on the left and progressive um i'm not i'm not talking about them but i'm talking about you know your sort of your mainstream democrat voters if someone like Biden does get in, they they might get a lot more complacent again, and then, and who knows? I mean, I could see. Let's say a third party, a left wing third party, a new party starts and and gains some power. I could see them. I mean, and I'm not saying this to to say don't start a party like that, but I'm saying there could be a scenario where, let's say in the next election, they 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 really get a lot of votes. But they and let's say it's a three way race, right? There's a Democrat nominee, a uh, Republican nominee, and uh, a new left party uh, nominee. And uh, the left party nominee takes more votes away from the Democrats than it does the Republicans, and that hands the Republican uh, the the victory. I could see that happening. I mean, if you look at '92, you know, you had Bill Clinton running for the first time, and he was running against. Uh, was it was it Dole? I can't remember. I think it was um, Dole the first time, right? And it With was Perot, you mean? No, no, I'm sorry. It was George Bush uh senior. Oh, he was the incumbent. He was running right? against George Bush Senior and the third party candidate was Ross Perot. Right. Now I would guess and Ross Perot that year got, I believe, somewhere around eighteen percent of the vote. Yeah. He got like eighteen million votes. That's a lot of fucking votes. Yeah. And most of those, I would bet came from people who would have voted for Bush. Sure. So, so yeah. it, you can make an argument that he handed the election to Clinton. That's right. And so yeah, I can see the reverse similar... happening where if a, a third party came up and they, they didn't get enough and, and they handed it to Republicans. I mean, I mean, but like I said, that's just one scenario. I'm not, I'm not saying that for anyone listening. I'm not saying that to say, don't start a third party. I'm just saying, no, of course, I can see that happening. And it, isn't it interesting how y you you bring up Perot, who was like Trump, another uh, billionaire who was a straight shooter who appealed to the, the 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 absurdity to me of how just simply how we never have poor candidates or working class people who are economically challenged or disadvantaged, like the the the, the firewall that exists even to to keep so that these guys have to become working class, like Ross Perot has to become a working class hero in some way or Trump, you know, it's, it's fascinating how, how that psychology works. Ted, I say this in my act and I'll say it again. If you can't trust billionaires, who can you trust? Ted? The, you know, Cops. I'm going to have Cops. to think on that. Cops. Yeah, that's, that's true. Cops. That's true. Ted, the most trustworthy person in the world, a billionaire cop. <laughs> you know they've done nothing wrong <laughs> protect and serve and 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 accumulate wealth um tell me about before before we uh part ways judah tell me about how comedy look i, I thought things were going okay here but if you want to part ways that's all right things are going great but i don't i don't want to look you know, ted ted if it's not going well for you that's okay that's fine it's your call i don't <laughs> i don't pressure people i know you have to tend to the the map behind you if there. you want to call it off ted that's okay <laughs> <laughs> Tell me how the country's uh, looking great, Ted. It's looking it does. Great. It does. Um, I'm seeing some good trends there. Yep. 
uh, how how has comedy been for you? I know you've been relatively active uh, online shows and things like that. Yeah. Tell me what comedy has looked like for you in these pandemic months. Um. Well, it's in, well, you know, I was sick for a while in March. Um, I don't know if I had it or not, but I was sick for a while in March, so I wasn't doing much then. Um, but I've been doing shows for months now, so I'm not doing any shows yet in person at venues, whether indoor or outdoor. Mm-hmm. Um, but I am doing probably about five or more sets a week, um, sometimes less, sometimes more, Um and I'm doing about three of my own shows a week. So where okay, so you're I booking... produce the show. Okay, so three of them are your, your own that you put together. Yeah, so, and then so basically others. my shows are I produce it. I'll, I'll, have a, I'll hire a comic to host it. Uh, I'll have someone doing tech, you know, running the whole Zoom room. And I will have an opening comic. And then I will go on. Uh, so they do combined... The first comic does 10 to 15. The next comic does 5 to 10. And then I usually do about an hour and a half. And it's, and the way my Zoom shows are set up, it's, it's not like uh, you can, the, as an audience member, um, you, you can hear and see me. And you can also hear and see the other audience members. So nobody's uh, muted. No, they can be if, if, the, if you want, you know. So okay. it's a similar dynamic to in a comedy club. Like, if you don't want to be picked on at a comedy club, don't sit in the front row, right? So if you want to come and watch my shows and you don't want to be talked to or be seen by anybody, turn your camera off, uh, hit your mute button, and you can just watch silently. Uh, Or you can have your camera on, you can have your mic on, and it's like you're sitting in the front row. Um, So so, uh, the option's there. So it's interactive is what I'm saying. So I'll ask the audience, you know, questions about my presidential platform, and they'll ask me questions. I'll give them jokes back. And uh, so so as a comic, you can hear and see the audience uh, laughing and responding. So um, has it been a seamless transition to that? Or, 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 or is it something you know, that it, took, took a well, little bit of getting used to? It actually has been fairly seamless. Um, it's uh, before I did any, I had like heard about because I'd never heard of Zoom before. I don't know. I'm 75 years old, Ted. I'm 75 years old. I don't think too many people had before the pandemic. I don't know technology. So so I'd heard about Zoom, and then I watched some shows, and I saw – I think I saw some shows where, you know, it was like doing an Instagram Live where the audience can only write comments in like a chat or something, a scrolling chat. Uh, And then I saw a show where the audience – you can interact with the audience. And I was like, oh, this, this seems pretty cool. And I talked with some comics who had been doing it already, and they were saying there's some differences because sometimes there's a little bit of a delay. So sometimes your timing might have to be a little bit different or you might have to slow down a little bit or maybe wait for the laugh a little longer. Yep. Um, but it, it, it all works out. It's kind of like if you're, in a, if you're in a tiny venue where there's only 20 audience members, and then if you're in some big venue where there's thousands of people, you probably sl- change your timing a little bit, you know, you because yeah. you're responding to the audience. Well, it's the same thing on a computer. So um, I had, so I had no idea how it was going to work. So it, it was it's kind of been like going to technical school, um, watching uh, all kinds of tutorials on YouTube. You know, I De- own De- my De- own De- microphone now. De- I've been De- doing comedy over 30 years. I've never owned a microphone, so I own a microphone now. Uh, you know, De- I built... Can I, can I ask, DeVry De- 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 didn't prepare you for uh, these not. technical... Ted, it did not, Ted. Okay. I'm not affiliated. Not affiliated. Okay. No offense it. to anyone who is, but I'm not affiliated. Right. You know, I built the set. Yeah. Uh, you know, so it's... I had to learn all these things I didn't know. So it's, it's kind of like going to like a little, you know online school that you're making yourself um so so yeah so the shows are great i love doing the shows it's um you know i don't get that much of an audience but if you get you know even if you get 10 audience members who have their cameras on and their microphones on so you can interact it's great 
So you're getting, you're getting 10 people that genuinely w- want to be yeah, there yeah. for that. My shows, I, I usually get like 20 to 50 people coming to the shows mm-hmm. and my shows are cheap. It's, ba- it's pay what you want starting at a dollar. So for $1, you, you will be seeing a 90 minute to two hour long show from a master. Uh, yeah. Uh, so it, you know, work took me out to LA for a little bit about 20 years ago. And L.A. in general, there's less stage time than New York City. Um, you know, New York, if you want and you're a working comic in the city, you can get up a few times a night. In L.A., that's hard to do. So in L.A., I remember finding myself, you did a little more work off stage, you know, since you're not working on stage as much. And one of the venues I did in L.A. was I used to do this, this place. It was a youth hostel. And they had a show two nights a week, and I would go every fucking time there. And it was great. But it was often always, about 50% of the audience was always the same audience. Oh, wow. So it forced you to come up with a lot of new material. Uh, this I'm talking about myself. Or do a lot of stuff on the fly, just riffing, you know, crowd work and, and stuff. So was that so- a skill? That you develop, you didn't always have that on your tool belt. I always did that. No, I always did. I always did a lot of one-liners. I always did um, uh, a lot of crowd work. Always, always did that. Um, persona has changed over the years because you know I'm, uh, you know, I started when I was 19. You know, I'm a lot older now, <laughs> so it's, yeah. it's a different persona at 19, and then sure. and uh, and now. You know, I started over 30 years ago. So, yeah. um, and then. So, so anyway, so it's a little like that. So I have a lot of regulars coming to the shows. So, so I need to come up with, I don't get the, it's not like one thing that's great about doing comedy in New York is that if I have a new joke, I can work on it. I can do four sets that night and I can work on that joke four times in one night. I can be honing it four times. Yep. Yep. So, but in New York, one of the things that's frustrating is the sets are often 10 to 15 minutes. You know, so it, it sucks, you know. You, mm-hmm. um, so now I'm doing about three shows a week, but each set is about 90 minutes. So I don't have that repetition where I can really be honing the joke so much. But mm-hmm. since I have a lot of repeat audience members, it's forcing me to come up with a lot more new material, sure, So, which sure. is a good thing. So there's pluses and minuses. Yeah, um, no, and you're keeping that muscle very strong. I mean, to do yeah. 90 minutes is no small feat. Yeah, and, then, and doing it on a computer is 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 uh you know if you're getting big laughs on the computer that you know theoretically in person it should be even a lot bigger you know yeah um, for sure for sure and, but and, it works you know and it, it really i mean i know it, not everyone likes doing them you know and, yeah. and and that's fine not everybody has to but but i've been liking it and, yeah. and right now it's pretty much my only option because i'm not doing any in-person shows right now so well, I remember, you know, going back to the early days for me uh, at, at the cellar and doing those like after midnight sets. It would be like you and Artie Fuqua and and, uh, you know, we, we've had a, a long journey together, man. So it's it's mm-hmm. been great to uh, yeah. to watch you over the years. And, and still, Thanks, man. yeah, always love watching you work. And uh, not but, only uh, well, the I, way I also... you meld, if I can just say the way you yeah. meld comedy and a message, even though it's it can be silly and and you know it, it's it's always fun, but uh, right. nobody's smarter, despite the fact that you know you you kind of uh, under underplay that. But you nobody's Thanks, smarter. Man. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I never do anything preachy. Um, you know, I never like reprimand people for thinking a certain way. But you know, I yeah. get pe- I you know I like to get you know obviously laughing is is the main thing but i like getting people to think i don't really tell them what to think they could, they should come up with that on their own um yep i think anytime you force somebody to if you're trying to force somebody to think away it's 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 probably not going to work you know but when you're wearing a world champion hat the people would be foolish not to uh to take exactly. seriously always listen to athletes ted there you go there you and go. reality tv show doctors always <laughs> trust reality tv show doctors <laughs> Judah Friedlander, thanks, buddy. So thanks, good, dude. So Much good love. To talk Keep to fighting, you. dude. Yep, you too. Hope to see you soon. You know it. Judah Friedlander, the world champion. Check out one of his Zoom shows. Winners. Yeah. And follow yeah, uh, him. Next yeah, week, yeah. Thursday, I got one. Say what? What day? Thursday, November twelfth, eight p.m. Eastern. There it is. Yeah, folks. I do about three a week. Usually two at eight p.m. Eastern. 
and one at 3 p.m. Eastern. Perfect. Judah World Champ, follow him on all the social medias and uh, check out one of his shows real soon. Thank you, Judah. Yeah. Thanks, buddy. I'll see you soon. You know You got it, pal. Winners. <laughs> Love Judah. That guy, uh, as I said, we have got a, a long history together in New York City coming up through, uh, through the ranks. And uh, the thing I love about Judah is just the person that he is. You know, he, he treats everybody with respect and he treats everyone the same, the way they should be treated. Um, whether you're an open micer or you're some big famous comedian coming in or a member of the staff of the comedy club or somebody who's in the audience and comes up and says hello, uh, he's just a, a good hearted guy who uh, is one of the funniest guys around and check out his special on Netflix as well. All right, friends. Um, again, if you wish to support the show and we are, I think 32 episodes in now, is that right, Matthew? I think it's Correct. 32. Thank you, Matthew. Any updates on uh, has, has Trump declared himself the, the world champ? I think he has, yeah, unfortunately. Well, I think Judah will take him down uh, in short order. Um, again, folks, if you wish to support the fine work that we are doing here, please visit patreon.com slash Ted Alexandro. We have two tiers, uh, a lot of stand-up bonus content. Um, we just put up another stand-up clip that is only available on Patreon. There, there's, I think, maybe four clips now of, of stand-up, some extended sets, some uh, shorter jokes or, or a couple of, you know, a couple of jokes strung together. Um, but that content is exclusive to patreon.com slash Ted Alexandro. And of course, uh, the Ted Alexandro Comedy Academy is exclusive there as well for the $20 uh, patrons. And uh, the next class is upcoming this week. That'll be, I think, the fifth class in an ongoing series of uh, me talking about the various aspects of stand-up comedy, many of which are touched on in this Ted Alexandro show as well. But in the Academy, we go in deep and we delve into uh, a lot of the things that I have learned over my close to 30 years as a stand-up comedian. And there's always more things to learn. That's one of the things I love, uh, especially coming up through New York. Uh, I always considered myself really a student, you know, as I was starting. And in fact, I really tried to structure it as if I was in school. I, I kind of mapped out a, a course load of, uh, of writing, of performing, of uh, consuming comedy, of reading about comedy and its history. Uh, so New York City and coming up through New York really affords you the opportunity to watch great comedians like Judah and so many uh, on a nightly basis. You know, a lot of great comedy, also a lot of bad comedy to watch in New York just because there's a lot of comedy, period. So, uh, you know, as any comedian will tell you, you learn... Uh, in equal measure from the greats and from the not so great, because sometimes that can give you a little boost of ego or of confidence to say like, Oh, well, I, I can at least do, <laughs> do as well as that. Um, so those, uh, those classes, as I said, are ongoing and they can be accessed at patreon.com slash Ted Alexandro. And thank you to all uh, the folks who have already subscribed and all the kind words that have been coming in. Uh, I actually got a, a nice message. Maybe I'll try to have this guy on the show at some point of somebody who tried comedy for the first time and had been watching the, uh, the um, classes and had inter I had inter interacted with him a few times on Instagram Messenger. And uh, he just did comedy for the first time and said it, it went well. 
So, uh, you know, we're out there doing the work, folks. We're, we're getting people on the stages, even though I am in semi-retirement. All right. Uh, let's see. There, there were one or two other texts. Let me just get to those. After what happened in 2016, are either of you surprised by the inaccuracy of the election polls? I will take this one. Um, no, I, I am not surprised by the inaccurate. How could anything being inaccurate surprise anyone at this point? Um, you know, all of the games that are played with voter suppression and moving people off the rolls and obviously gerrymandering and long lines, every, every obstruction that is put in place to keep people from voting, uh, you know, polling would probably be part and parcel of that as well, because there, there were, uh, there were inaccuracies and, and things outside of the margin of error in a lot of uh, exit polls, you know, from, I know both from the primaries and the general election. So, all sorts of games are played. I have no doubt. Uh, love the content. Keep up the great work. Thank you. We welcome kind words as well. Thank you for that. Uh, and for obviously all the folks I've neglected in the, in the, uh, in the comments, this country is held together with scotch tape. Yes. Yes, indeed. Matthew Film Guy, I recognize your voice. Yes, that is Matthew Film Guy. Oh, yeah. It's Matthew Film Guy, a.k.a. producer extraordinaire on the Ted Alexandro Show. That's right. That's right. Oh, Matthew yeah. Matthew wears many hats, folks. He is not just here talk about scotch tape. I, I, would, I would say more glue, but he is the glue of the Ted Alexandro Show and a frequent guest on Sam Cedar's Majority Report. He goes on, uh, Matthew, is that every Friday as, uh, as Matthew Film Guy? No, I'm in, I'm in his stable of uh, regular guests. I'd say it's like once every month and a half or so. Sam, step that up. That should be, that should be if not weekly. Uh, I, I was just on his 12-hour uh, uh, 10th anniversary show the other day on Election Day, thankfully going on before the, the shit show really started. But uh, <laughs> Well, that's a, that's a wise move on, on Sam's behalf. Uh, so yeah, check out Matthew and, and Matthew, when you go on there, you're, you're uh, usually in the capacity of talking about uh, no, every third films. word, every third word. Yeah. Every third word. What is the Ted Alexandro show? Of course. <laughs> no, no. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm talking about <laughs> you're, you're plugging uh, different films and, and you also teach film. Uh, That's right. I'm his film hat. guy. We talk about movies. I, I recommend movies that he should say he's going to watch and then not watch mostly for his audience to, to watch, you know? Can you, throw, the, can you throw a recommendation at us tonight? Um, wow. Uh, well, you know, to be honest, we watched Grapes of Wrath in my class. I teach a senior citizen's film appreciation class. We watched Grapes of Wrath, and I had never seen it before. I mean, that. Oh, wow. Talk about the a film that with, everybody uh, should. Henry Fonda. Yeah. It just is uh, relevant, and in some ways, maybe more so now that we've lost touch with the whole like farmers' union kind of movement. And so that's if you're in a political mood, you can't do too much worse than grapes of wrath right now. Thank you. Can I call you Matthew film guy, even, even on this show, or is that exclusive? That's fine. If you're at the right Patreon level, you can call me whatever you want. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. You know, you can call me whatever you want. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, grapes of wrath folks. That is a, that is a classic, honestly, probably my favorite novel, uh, Steinbeck, obviously. And uh, a great performance by uh, by Henry Fonda as Tom Tom Jode. Greetings, Ted. This is your Queens Village friend from years ago, Eric Hatcher from Oklahoma. Hello, Eric. Oklahoma voters accounted for six thousand votes for Kanye West. That was a palm to the face. Yeah, I think he did better than ten thousand in, in a lot of uh, a lot of states. Welcome. One thing I do appreciate about the prolonged outcome of this election, the suffering Donald J. Trump must now be going through. <laughs> he is going nuts. Picture getting into a fight and being knocked out with one punch. The suffering is over quickly. But in the case of our election, Mr. Trump has a long, slow beating. 
<laughs> Here's hoping. Justice, looking forward very much to your show tonight. Peace and love to you and your family. Peace and love to you as well, Eric Hatcher. Eric has been on the show before. He is the man who uh, introduced me to the roof of PS33. The roof was not on fire, but it may as well have been because uh, it, it set me on fire. We snuck, we snuck up to the roof. Eric uh, was my classmate at PS33 in Queens Village in, I think, third or fourth grade. And uh, he got me into sneaking out of class. <laughs> Uh, and he would uh, like the gate was open like usually you could only go up to the fifth floor and then there was like a like some sort of locked gate that was never locked i never even tried it but eric was like yeah you can just go up so we would go up on the roof occasionally and uh it was it was just i never felt so alive before or since there was like a sea of balls up there because everyone who had like you know lost a uh a spa a spaldine you remember the spaldines or a a a handball all various balls up there on the on the roof so we would collect a few of those and we would just hang out until uh for whatever length of time we felt the teacher would not notice so thank you for for checking in eric hatcher well friends uh the beat goes on the count goes on who knows how long that will continue uh it is a a bit of a circus uh this country has been for for many years and and shows no signs of slowing down but my hope is that the ringmaster will be one joe biden if only to get trump out of the red tails and top hat because I, for one, have had enough. All right, friends, thank you so much for watching. Again, uh, please do hit subscribe, hit the notifications bell, hit like on this video, as 27 of you already have. And uh, go to patreon.com slash Ted Alexandro to support the show. Thanks, everybody. We thank, as always, producer extraordinaire, the man on the ones and twos. He's also known as Matthew Film Guy. Please. Join me in thanking Matthew L. Weiss. Ah, oh, yeah. And we thank the maestro, the man who provides the music that you hear from start to finish. Pro Pro DLC. Thank you, maestro, for all that you bring to the Ted Alexandro show. And as always, we thank our executive producer extraordinaire. She rules with an iron fist, but a heart of gold. She is Madeline Geraldine. I love you very, very much. Thank you, friends, for joining us. Be well, keep refreshing, and let's get those final six over the top. Until next time, good night. And we are clear. All right. Thank you, sir. That was great.